Julie, welcome to Saltier Politics. This could not be a better week for us to talk news, especially with the Andrew Cuomo news just breaking yesterday. Julie, I'm going to give you the floor because you have you did a great thread on Twitter if you want to talk about that. Um, so I, I kind of want to devote this whole podcast to Andrew Cuomo because this is literally, in a nutshell, everything that I've been banging my head about for the last God knows how many years, really since 2017. I'm, I have said consistently when it comes to my own personal experience that, and, and I've heard from a lot of other women who would agree with me, I don't want to say this as a blanket statement for a lot of women um, because I, I don't know, but but I do want to say that from my own experience and from the vast majority of experiences that I've that I've had women share with me that this applies. The harassment is bad, but what's really much worse is the retaliation. If you are hit on, that's icky and it's uncomfortable. Or if somebody calls you a really bad word or if somebody treats you in a kind of toxic way, that's really bad. But it's when you say no, or you push back and then you're retaliated against where when it is when it gets off the hook insane and awful, right? This just this whole Cuomo report, and I read every single word of it. It's about 186 pages, I think, and I strongly urge, I know it's a lot, um, but I strongly urge everybody who has the time to do it to read it. Um, because it's just Nothing I'm going to say is going to do justice to reading the words of the women themselves. Um, and the report is mostly the words of the women themselves and, and Andrew Cuomo's words and, and the words of his staff as well. So I, I don't want to say it's just the women's words. It's, it's obviously taking into account both sides of the issue. Um, but a couple of, couple of things emanate from this report. One, there is no way in hell that Andrew Cuomo would have been held accountable. And there is no way in hell that anybody in his position will ever be held accountable unless you have a truly independent investigation. And by independent investigation, I mean the following, not an internal investigation, not an external investigation where the investigator is paid by the company or the person who is being investigated, um, but a truly independent investigation. So in the case of Andrew Cuomo, you had several investigations going on. One was some investigation that he was doing internally, which was, of course, a farce. And even if it wasn't a farce, it would have been perceived as a farce because those investigators were ultimately responsive to the person. I mean, look, it's the old expression, right? He who calls, pays the piper calls the tune. If you work for Andrew Cuomo, you are going to be answerable to Andrew Cuomo. If you are an outside law firm hired by Andrew Cuomo or an organization, you are going to be answerable to the person who hired you. So that's just that goes without saying. The second thing that I think is fascinating about this is that, um, so again, unless you have an independent investigation, and what's crucial here is that this was an investigation that allowed the investigating body, in this case, the attorney general, to put people under oath, which I think is very, very, very crucial, and I'll get to why in a second. So that's issue one. Issue two is that this whole, the, the travesty what Andrew Cuomo did is not as much about the fact that he was gross towards women and he was, but it's the lengths to which he and his staff went to intimidate and retaliate against women who dared to speak out and to send a message to those who potentially could have spoken out that if they were considering speaking out, they should think twice because their careers would be destroyed. That is number two. Uh, and that happens consistently. And that is the reason that you don't ever have anybody being held accountable in politics and government or, or wh why people so allow themselves to act as enablers to cover up for predators. And number three, and this I want to say, I don't want to sound like somebody who beats up in the press. You know, I don't. You know, I sort of consider myself an honorary member of the press, although I'm not and I never have been, but I've certainly worked around journalists. I, I read a column for a newspaper. I, I, I worked in a news organization for a long time. I, I truly, you know, have a tremendous amount of respect for the media. But in this case, the media and not in just in this case, but in so many cases like this, the media doesn't just serve as a isn't just not productive. It's almost counterproductive. It's almost it almost serves as a useful idiot 
role. And I'll explain why in a second as well. So let's let's take each one of those at a time and then I'm going to stop speaking and, and listen to your thoughts on this. But let me just get this all out. So first and foremost, the reason that it's important to have people under oath is that because in, I believe, December or, or of 19 or, or January of 20, uh, Lindsay Boylan, who was a high ranking woman in New York City politics, in New York State politics at the time, she had served in the governor's office in a high ranking role. She had then served in New York State government at a high ranking role. She had run, uh, I believe, for Congress against Congressman Jerry Nadler in the Upper West Side or in, in a Manhattan um, congressional district. Uh, she was then running for Manhattan Borough president. Uh, so she was a high profile woman and she was a very established woman politically. This is not somebody who was just starting out her career. She put out a tweet accusing Cuomo of creating a hostile work environment and a toxic work environment for women. And then she expounded upon that tweet or that series of tweets in a Medium article. And in that Medium article, in that Medium post, she made a, a number of allegations, including that she was on a series of flights with Cuomo and members of his staff. And she said that at one point the governor turned to her and said, hey, we should play strip poker, and that she took that to mean that he was saying that to her and that she clearly took that as, as him hitting on her as any woman would, right? You don't propose that some woman play strip poker with you unless you're looking to get naked with the woman. Uh, shortly after she did that, the governor's office um, put out a statement calling her a liar and effectively discrediting what she said. Well, under oath, and it is only because they were placed under oath, suddenly, and that they'd never recalled that that, that she had ever, that the governor ever said that, there was no recollection whatsoever. Of course, he'd never say that. They don't remember him ever saying that. Well, sure enough, as they were placed under oath, of course, one of them broke because nobody wants to get indicted for perjury. And miraculously remembered, of course, that the governor did say that, and of course, that it was directed at her, and of course, that the governor did say that he wanted to play strip poker with her. Had this not been an investigation that was independently conducted and had this man who finally admitted that, of course, the governor did say this, not said this, say this under oath, the truth would never have come out. And in fact, that erroneous and not even erroneous, that that false press statement would have been allowed to stand. And what's more devastating about this is the media was completely derelict in its responsibilities because the media did the following. The media watched as Andrew Cuomo's staff took redacted personnel files that belonged to this woman when she worked in state government, redacted, selectively cherry-picked files that were leaked to the media to try to discredit her and proceeded to write he said, she said stories. The purpose for Andrew Cuomo to do that was not just to discredit Lindsay Boylan, but it was to say to other women, none of whom were as powerful as Lindsay Boylan, none of whom had the profile that Lindsay Boylan had, that if any of you ever dare to speak up, if any of you think about coming forward, the same will be done to you, your careers will be over. And the one thread that runs through all 186 or so pages of this report is the deep fear that each of these women had about their careers being destroyed if they came forward. In fact, a lot of them did not want to come forward and only were forced to come forward because they were effectively subpoenaed and were under oath. And or others came forward only because they felt they were protected because this was an independent investigation and because this was law enforcement and not because it was an internal investigation. Um, the media fell down on the job because the media didn't immediately write a story upon receiving these redacted files trashing her saying, uh, wait a second, this is a retaliatory bullshit, disgusting tactic that the governor is employing to try to destroy a woman who is alleging something very serious about the governor. What the media did was continue to write stories saying, well, the governor is alleging A and she's alleging B. And, oh, let's throw up our hands because who knows here, right? It's a he said, she said, let's muddy the waters, which is exactly what the governor wanted to do. They just wanted to muddy the waters. There was no responsibility on behalf of the media to really look at what the story was here, which is not that this was a he said, she said, 
but that the governor's office was effectively using this tactic to try to discredit an accuser and cast a pall over future women coming forward to buttress her story. And the media, in my mind, has blood on its hands as a result of that. There was a huge dereliction of duty there. And that is something for the reporters to consider. Because this happens consistently. Consistently. It is such, I mean, listen, I've worked in politics my whole life. It is such an obvious tactic. Right? Emily says Julie did A. Julie says, oh, really? Well, let me show you some really horrible stuff about Emily that nobody knows except for me that I'm going to redact, some of which is true, some of which may not be true. And the media just reprints everything I say. And the narrative is, well, Emily made some really horrible, credible allegation against Julie. And Julie said something about Emily that, you know, is kind of maybe, I don't know, but, but she said, she said, as opposed to saying, wait a second. Why is Julie taking proprietary information that she's not even supposed to be releasing because it's confidential information she should not be releasing? Could she potentially be doing this because she wants to destroy Emily and she shouldn't be doing this? Maybe there's something to Emily's story if Julie's doing this. What What's so, really incredible is what must be the kind of psychological warfare that is going on within these women's heads who have had this interaction with Cuomo know that nothing is going to happen or having to weigh that they either say something and stop the discomfort and awful things that Cuomo is saying off the cuff and and weigh that with, you know, they're at the top of their game. They're working in the governor's office. Like, am I going to lose my job? And that must be very similar. And I, with what I, I I believe you even had to weigh, like, do you, do you go public with something? Do you say something? Or, you know, you're working at the top of your game when it comes to political commentary at Fox, like it, having to weigh everything and, and stay quiet and have this internal torm- turmoil going on must be horrific. So let me just say this. I knew by the time I came forward, I knew that it was that it would end my career at Fox. I mean, I was hoping it wouldn't. Um, I'm upset it did. But somewhere deep down, I, I knew. And but that's not, you know, look, um, I can't really talk about Fox. You know, I have an NDA, so I can't talk about it. The bigger travesty is not me. The bigger travesty are young women who are just, you know, think about who predators prey on, right? There's a quote from Charlotte Bennett, who was one of the women who's 25 years old, um, which is, which is just, I mean, it's, it's so devastating. I'm just going to read it because it's so awful. Um, I think she was 25 years old. She was a sexual assault survivor. She was working close to the governor. Um, He hit on her. She complained about it to members of his staff because there's obviously no other mechanism that she knew about to complain, which begs the question, why not? This is the quote. The verbal abuse, intimidation, and living in constant fear were all horribly toxic, dehumanizing, and traumatizing. I was scared to imagine what would happen if I rejected him, so I disappeared instead. My time in public service ended because he was bored and lonely. It still breaks my heart. That's it. Her career is over through no fault of her own. You know why? Because one guy decided to wake up and hit on her. So this woman had three choices. She could either keep her mouth shut and do nothing. Well, I guess she had three choices. One is she could acquiesce and and I guess sleep with him, which is dehumanizing to protect her career. Two, she could just shut up and do nothing, in which case he could still continue to retaliate against her for doing nothing. Or three, she could have complained as she did, and and, and she's out of public service. There, there are no good answers here. None. I, I would like to hear also your reaction to Cuomo's press conference yesterday, because him, his argument to sum it up, I'm Italian. It's what we do. As an Italian, no, it's not. No. What is? What was your reaction to that I mean, display? it's over. And my reaction to that is I have been around politicians long enough to know 
that this is where Andrew Cuomo is right now. There is nobody left in his circle who is speaking truth to power, and there has not been anybody in his inner circle who's been speaking truth to power to him probably for many years. What is left for Andrew Cuomo are people who are true believers in Andrew Cuomo and who believe that his political instincts are always correct or who understand that saying no to Andrew Cuomo will get them thrown out of his inner circle or inner sanctum. And so regardless of the reason, there is nobody in his life who can say to Andrew Cuomo, you're acting like a moron. And there has not been for a very long time. And so as a result of that, I think that that's the, that's the difficulty. And it's not just Andrew Cuomo. From everything I read about Trump, that that's the disease that he has. I mean, a lot of these politicians have it. I mean, in fact, most of these politicians have it. Um, they don't like people around them, whether they say they do or they don't, who, who, who tell them the truth. And when you do, you get kicked out of the inner circle or, um, you know, their attitude is, well, if you were so smart, why aren't you sitting in the governor's chair? Why are you here? And why, you know, why aren't you in my seat? Of course, Andrew Cuomo's saying what he's saying. And because there's nobody there to say to him, are you crazy? I mean, look, Andrew Cuomo didn't sit there and put together that that reel of, of Bill Clinton. Sorry, of, of Barack Obama. Oh, my God. And, 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 and George Bush hugging hurricane survivors. Somebody must have done that for him, right? That is a bold move. I'm but just... I, but I mean, think about it. Like, there is staff out there who's like, he said to them, hey, find pictures of Barack Obama and George Bush hugging people. And they're like, that's a great idea, Gov. We'll do that. Let's pull pictures of George Bush hugging people. I don't know where that was after Hurricane or 9-11. I don't know where that was. And let's put, you know, pull pictures of Barack Obama hugging people after Sandy Hooker. I don't even know where that picture came from either. But I mean, really, uh, it's just he's just got to go. It's over. I mean, it's over. I, I will say this. This is a Democratic state with a Democratic attorney general who just conducted a scathing investigation. And he's about to be impeached by a Democratic legislature and convicted by a Democratic uh, state assembly and convicted by a Democratic Senate if he doesn't resign. Right. That's a foregone conclusion, I think. The entire congressional delegation, overwhelmingly Democratic, and the two Democratic senators here have called on him to resign. Uh, contrast that with the Republican Party. Mm-hmm. Matt, Matt, Matt Gates is still in the Republican caucus. Donald Trump has had 27 or so women accuse him of, of behavior that exceeds anything that Cuomo was accused of. Can you imagine any kind of independent investigation launched by an attorney general, a Republican attorney general, into him? I guess, how do you stop then? Because what, what you see a lot on Twitter and is, is a lot of Democrats and then Republicans saying, you know, the, the Democrats are just like this cancel culture. Well, what because, cancel- for example, like Al Franken was out. And, you know, at the same time, the Republicans are not keep it, are, are keeping Trump, Gates, are not doing anything. Matt Gates, yeah. I mean... Listen, Al Franken was out without any kind of investigation. Mm-hmm. Al Franken was just pushed out without any kind of investigation. Whereas this was a thorough investigation where every single one of these women was found to be credible. And if you read the testimony from Cuomo and his aides, I mean, you don't have to believe. I mean, his own aides contradict his behavior. Their own testimony, not their own testimony, his own aides contradict what they had previously said publicly. That's what's so fascinating. You stu- you put people under oath and suddenly things that they said publicly in the press turn out to be totally false. So also, though, what is a way to really, I guess, combat this from you can't have these internal investigations because even just local government if you're a city commissioner you appoint people on the board so it's people who support you are already within the government so how i guess what is the infrastructure that needs to be put in place to ensure that this happens again with someone else that people are safe you need an independent investigative body to do this what that looks like i don't know um 
but you do need an independent investigative body to do this. In New Jersey, for example, there's legislation right now to create an independent investigative body under the auspices of their um, Election Law Enforcement Commission, which uh, right now currently regulates campaign finance to basically investigate these kinds of complaints. And because the attorney general in New Jersey, for example, is appointed by the governor, so there's no way that could be an independent investigation. Mm -hmm. But it does speak to the fact that you do need some sort of independent investigative body. Right. Um, And critically with subpoena power. Okay. Because without subpoena power, they will continue to lie. The only reason some of these staffers told the truth is because they feared lying under oath. There's no doubt in my mind. Because they, they, they lied to the media. They admitted they lied to the media. Or suddenly, I'm sorry, it's not that they lied to the media. They seem to have very sudden recall of facts nine months later that they somehow didn't have nine months earlier when they were speaking to the media. That exonerated Linda, Lindsay Boylan. You know, I saw a tweet yesterday that Cuomo had in like 2013. He's like, all predators should be immediately punished and blah, blah, blah. And it's like, can you, are you that ignorant? Do you know what you're doing? Or do you just have this feeling of, I can just get away with it? It's me. It's nothing. Well, you know, you ask Andrew Cuomo if he's a predator and he probably would say no. He probably believes his own bullshit. Right. I bet, I bet you he does. I think there gets to be a group think mentality where these people start to believe it. Mm-hmm. And I can tell you in politics, there is certainly a mentality where it's circle the leader. And we've got to discredit anybody who takes out the leader, because if you take out the leader, uh, that means our own careers are destroyed. So let's stow whatever ethics or values we might have brought to the table originally. Think about why some of these people originally got into the business, some of these Cuomo enablers, when they were 21, 22 years old, and they volunteered as college Democrats or whatever. I mean, they probably consider themselves good liberals and good feminists and good whatever. And then, you know, slowly but surely, it becomes a a grab for power. What advice would you give, you know, someone who's listening to this podcast, and you know, they might not be a New Yorker, but to just, I guess, be an ally to this cause of believing people when they speak to be an advocate or to help advocate and to make sure that this doesn't happen in her community? Well, I mean, the one thing I will say is if you see a story that says that some woman came forward and alleged something awful happened to her at work, let's take sexual harassment aside. She said that somebody called her the N-word, right? She was racially discriminated against. Somebody called her the N-word. And suddenly that her boss called her the N-word. And suddenly her boss leaks proprietary information, files about her redacted um, that have nothing to do with anything to try to muddy the waters. Perhaps think about the fact that they're doing that not because they have a good response to what they're doing, but because they want to muddy the waters and understand that that actually buttresses the woman's case and that the story that should be written is that what her boss is engaging in is a systematic character assassination and destruction of her as opposed to a he said, she said story, which is usually the way it's written. I mean, I, I got to tell you, my anger at the media handled this has been brewing since the day that I saw those stories being written nine months ago. And it just exploded even more after I read these stories or after I read this report. And you know, me, you know that I don't go off on the media. No, I, I'm not I those people at all. Um, and, but it just infuriates me because it's the same damn thing all the time. And I guarantee you the next time it happens is the same thing. It's the same thing. And it, it's, it's the lowest hanging fruit. It is the lowest. I mean, let, let, let's talk about Gretchen Carlson, right? I can't talk about my own case, but I'll talk about her. Great example. She makes this explosive allegation against Roger Ailes. 
Fox News starts putting it out there that, oh, the reason Gretchen Carlson was let go was because her ratings were really bad and, 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 you know, she was, she wasn't cutting it and that's why she wasn't, you know, she wasn't renewed and, and that's why she was let go and it had nothing to do with all her allegations. And you had reporters writing that story. You had reporters writing that story. As opposed to saying, oh my God, this woman just has an incredible allegation that she put out there. And now they're putting out internal files on her that are redacted. And that's really wrong. And why are they trying to destroy her? And that's really the travesty here. I mean, I mean, I mean it's, it's, it's the same playbook. Exactly. Like, let's discredit. Let's discredit Gretchen. Let's muddy the waters to make let's everything discredit. else. Yeah. I mean, exactly it's such what an, they did. It's such a, it's such an easy tactic. I know it sounds so grumpy and we haven't spoken in a while. And I hope there's something happy you're going to ask me about because I'm so sorry that I sound so grumpy. Cause no, I don't mean, no. I mean, it's not that's happening, but uh, on a positive note, have you been making any more delicious cakes? I have not. No, okay. but I'm going to make them for you because I know you're coming out to our house this weekend. I am, and I'm so excited. It's going to be like camp for me. I'm going to get to golf. I'm going to get to play tennis. Life I know. It's going to be fantastic. All with a nine-year-old. I'm going to drink while you do that. But um, I know, but you're going you're gonna to come to the country club and golf and play tennis, which is nice because I belong to this country club and uh, – I'm not a country club person at all, as I think you know, nor do I golf or play tennis, but I have a nine-year-old who who does. Um, so that's why we belong to it. So I'm just going to sit there and watch you guys do it. I mean, he says he wants to live in Florida. I mean, within a couple of years, he's going to be embodying the Florida lifestyle with the tennis, well, the golf. Now he's into squash. I don't know if I told well, you that now, now he's into squash. That's his new thing. I mean, we might as well just get a house in Florida at this point. You know, he's not just obsessed with Florida. He's obsessed with the most Florida part of Florida, Boca. I mean. Because, as I always joked, I gave birth to an 80-year-old Jewish man. And, uh, yes, he's, he's, he's training. He's training to retire to Florida. Exactly. At the, at the age of nine. So I'm super excited for a weekend. I will make you a cake, um, which I haven't done in a long time because the cake has added up. After a year and a half of COVID, I was like, I gotta, I gotta stop making the cakes because all of a sudden I don't fit into any of my clothes anymore. Um, so, I prefer tahini or cream cheese frosting. I'm gonna make you the tahini cake because I haven't made that in a long time, and I know how much you like it. So I'm gonna make it. I'm gonna try to bring it um, out there. I'm gonna have to figure out how to transport it. But I'm actually excited because I'm having a little mini high school reunion um, at my house on Friday night here in the city. And, uh, one of the people coming is my friend, Chris, who I haven't seen since high school. It's been literally 30 years and he lives out in San Diego and he's an architect. And every time I post my tahini cake on Facebook, he always, um, makes really smart, but very hilarious architect jokes about how pathetic it looks from an architectural standpoint. So I'm going to actually make the tahini cake for him, which I'm sure he's going to have one. It piece will of. transcend his architectural brain and go right into his taste buds and just be a game changer. Exactly. So I'm going to have, let him have one piece of it, and then I will not let him have any more out of spite, and you can have the rest of it. Last question. Speaking of yeah. high school, if you – I don't know if you did the most likely to, but if you didn't have a most likely to, what would have been your most likely to in high school? Oh, I don't know. We didn't have a most likely to. Did you guys? We did. What were you? I was voted most likely to succeed. Oh, really? I was. Um, but what would you have been? I don't know. I should ask people that on Friday. I, I, want, I think you should take that poll and then reveal it next pod. But I think it's pretty, um, I think it would be kind of tainted by what I turned most likely in high school. I don't yeah. Know. Cause I feel like you, you had an edge, so it might not be. My thing in high school was like, I'll never be as cool ever in my life as I was in high school because I, you know, I went to high school in Princeton, New Jersey, and I was a senior and I was dating a senior in high school and I was dating a guy who was a sophomore at Princeton University. So as you can imagine, there is nothing, cred, the, street cred. There's nothing in the world that is that gives you more cred than being a townie and dating a guy who lives on campus and not just a freshman, 
but a sophomore, which really makes you like have cred. Um, and, um, who I also, by sure coincidence, it's been like reunion summer. I just actually, um, he's in the city. So I just had lunch with him also. Um, the first time in a very long time was great to catch up with him too. But what's interesting about that is that was like my high school, that was my senior year. So I've probably been most likely to be awesome back then because of my awesome, awesome street cred, which it's all been downhill ever since. As I said, I've never been as cool as I was back when I was 17 or 18, but that was a pretty 1991. Let me tell you something. (laughs) I rocked, I rocked 1991 based on that alone. Until next time. (laughs) Groovy. All right. I'll see you this weekend. Bye. Bye.